Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's July 11th. Today we celebrate National Rainier Cherry Day, and we'll also learn about the Scottish director of the Royal Botanic Gardens of Calcutta and Kew. We'll celebrate a journal entry from this day in 1938. It was written by one of Canada's most beloved naturalists. We'll also celebrate a rare orchid breeder from Denver. And we honor the discovery of a very unusual dwarf amaryllis species. Today's poetry features a beloved midsummer tree, the linden. And we grow that garden library with a book that will inspire you to decorate your outdoor space for both comfort and beauty, and for coaxing all of us to go out and enjoy our gardens as a space for breakfasts, lunchtime picnics, and even dinners by candlelight. Then finally, we'll wrap things up with the 103rd birthday of a Danish botanist. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners from around the world and today's curated news. First up is an email from Enrico Della out of Florence, Italy. Enrico shared a picture of the different varieties of tomatoes that he grows in the kitchen garden where he works in Florence. In the center is this beautiful black tomato. It looks like he's growing a little lemon tomato and some other nice varieties as well. Just beautiful. Then next up, Danny Perkins in Western North Carolina shared a beautiful clip of his garden. He's got echinacea and black-eyed Susans. I think I maybe see some salvia there and some type of umbel. In any case, this clip is showing his flower beds that flank a gravel path. It's very, very pretty. Then finally, Christy M. in Arizona sent pictures of the before and after of her garden. Actually, it's an entire makeover of her backyard space. And it's really just incredible. They installed a beautiful backyard patio area. It's flanked by gardens all around. She installed some outdoor curtains along with mosquito netting so they can enjoy it well into the evening. And then she has an entire corner of her garden that's devoted to growing sunflowers. And they are huge. They look to be about 10 feet tall already. They extend way above her privacy fence. Christy writes, I'm so glad that we finished this project and now we can enjoy it for the rest of the year. And then she writes, and I just wanted to wish my dad a very happy birthday today. And he loves gardening as much as I do. I learned my passion for growing sunflowers from him. Well, that's it for today's Gardener Greetings. If you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment, just send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to jennifer at thedailygardener.org, or you can share them in the Facebook group for the show. It's just that easy. Here's today's curated news. Jan Berry over at The Nerdy Farm Wife shared a great post recently called How to Harvest and Dry Flowers and Herbs from Your Garden. Jan writes, An ideal time to collect fresh flowers and herbs from your garden is on a dry, sunny day after morning dew has evaporated, but before the midday sun is out in full force. Some flowers, like dandelion, chamomile, calendula, and lavender, can be dried whole. The petals from large flowers, like roses and hollyhocks, should be separated from the flower head before drying. An exception to this is if you're drying small rosebuds. They can also be dried whole, But just be sure to turn them a few times a day so that one side doesn't dry flatter than the other. 
Well, I loved these tips from Jan about all the different techniques that we can use to dry our flowers. And she also had a few additional tips for flowers like elderflowers and lilacs. She writes, I dry flower clusters like these upside down on a towel, and that helps preserve some of the shape, small branches of leaves that easily lay flat when placed on a surface like elder leaf can stay together while drying. Leaves that cluster together like lemon balm and mint often do best if you detach each leaf before drying. So again, great tips from Jan here. And the blog post that she shared also has some really wonderful pictures, pictures that help show what she's talking about. So if you'd like to check out this post for yourself, just search for the word dry in the Facebook group for the show and Jan's post will pop right up. Then next up is just a reminder that today is National Rainier Cherry Day. Rainier cherries were bred at Washington State University by crossing Van cherries and Bing cherries. Rainier cherries are one of the most delicate and challenging cherries to grow because of one big drawback, their thin red-yellow skin. This makes Rainier cherries super sensitive to the elements, and they bruise easily. Even if a grower can address these challenges, they still have to contend with the birds. Birds love Rainier cherries, and they can eat as much as a third of the cherry crop before the harvest arrives. And here's a fun experiment for you. This week... Watch what happens if you add a few Rainier cherries to your bird feeder. Lots of fun. Then finally, I wrote a post recently called Deadhead to encourage more blooms. I was out gardening the other day with my daughter, and she asked, well, what happens if you don't deadhead? Well, long story short, you might miss out on valuable time that your plant could be using to create a second flush of blooms. So deadheading is very important in the ornamental garden. Plants to deadhead include coreopsis, blue and white clips, geraniums, dianthus. The list goes on and on. Another reason to deadhead is to encourage more blooms the following year. Dead flower heads become seed pods, and that takes energy away from the plant. This is why deadheading peonies and roses and iris and lilies is so important. And as a general rule, when any plant looks leggy, it will benefit from deadheading or plain old pruning. So get the clippers out and deadhead. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles and original blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. It's called the Daily Gardener Community. So there's no need to take notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for the Daily Gardener Community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. It was on this day in 1857 that the amateur botanist David Prane was born in Fetter Cairn, Scotland. Prane would ultimately become the director of the Royal Botanic Gardens of Calcutta and Kew. In 1887, David was sent to Calcutta to be the curator of the herbarium. While he was there, he researched Indian hemp along with other crops like wheat, mustard, pulses, and indigo. 
But David's most crucial work involved cinchona plantations. The bark of cinchona trees contains quinine, which is used to treat malaria. In David's obituary, it stated that he set up a system with the local post offices to send quinine to every Indian village and undoubtedly saved countless lives. After David returned to England, he became the director at Kew. During his tenure, David implemented many notable changes. He oversaw the effort to have the medicinal garden installed at Cambridge Cottage, and he acquired the Japanese gateway for the 1910 Japan-British Exhibition. In terms of his promotional efforts, David also reinstated the Q Bulletin. David's most significant professional challenge at Q came not from a plant, but a person. William Perdom was a subforeman at Q, and he was passionate about making sure that the garden staff was being treated fairly. The discord started when some of the gardeners discovered that their positions were only temporary. In addition, wages were well below market level. Even though all of these challenges were legacy issues that David had inherited, the problems fell squarely on his shoulders. David's humble origins gave him a heart for his workers, and he did his best to mediate the situation. While David stayed professional, Perdom made it personal, and he pressured David relentlessly. Finally, when he felt, despite his best efforts, that Perdom would never be satisfied, David forced the issue. He basically said to the powers that be that they had a choice. It was him or Perdom. In the end, David got the support that he needed, and Perdom moved on. In a noble gesture, David worked to get Perdom a lead spot on the expedition to China, sponsored by Harry Veach and the Arnold Arboretum. Today, history looks back at David Prane with admiration that he could recognize the talents of an employee, even while disagreeing with him acting with both fairness and integrity. And it was on this day in 1938 that the Canadian naturalist Charles Joseph Sariel wrote in his diary. He said, I find it hard to come in from the flower borders. My pansies are a garden of enchantment in themselves. People who love pansies should grow them from seed. I took the advice, and I have never had such a profusion of bloom and of so many colors. And it was on this day in 1941 that the Amarillo Daily News ran an article featuring Charles Sumner Lambie, who was a Denver-area civil engineer by day, and a rare orchid breeder by night. Charles grew up in Pittsburgh, tending his family's garden. He later married Margaret McCandless, and together they raised nine children. As his engineering firm became successful, Charles's wife said that he turned to the hobby of raising orchids as a means of relief from the stresses of his job. Charles shared an upside that he discovered about greenhouse gardening. He no longer suffered from hay fever as he did when he gardened outside. After sharing the various types of orchids that Charles grew, the article then shared his method for documenting his plants. It was pretty elaborate. Here's what it said. Mr. Lambie has a card index file on each plant. Here's a sample entry from the card of the orchid talisman. Talisman, 6 inches 
December 1938, Christmas, winter bloomer, October to early summer, variable, flowers large, sepals and petals, light to dark rose, lip, dark rich crimson, throat, purple with yellow gold veins. Ugh, can you imagine having all of those cards now? What a legacy. And then the article continues. Mr. Lambie puts a protective canopy over the orchids when they are in bloom, and he sprays them several times a day. When Mr. Lambie leaves town on business, Mrs. Lambie takes over the spraying and watering. As the reporter for the story was leaving, Mrs. Lambie showed him a small orchid and shared that Mr. Lambie was given the orchid when he subscribed to an orchid magazine. The orchid is called the Charles Lambie Rittenberry Orchid, and it's named for their grandson. And of course, it receives very careful attention, Mrs. Lambie added with a smile. And it was on this day in 1950 that a very unusual dwarf amaryllis species was collected in Peru by the eminent botanist Dr. Ramon Ferreira. Dr. Ferreira sent the bulbs to another botanist named Hamilton Traub in the United States. Unfortunately, the bulbs experienced frost while they were in the mail. Some of the bulbs were totally destroyed, and the surviving bulbs all had some level of damage. It took almost 18 months for Dr. Traub to nurse the frosted plants back to health. In recognition of his patience and skill, the amaryllis was named Hippiastrum traubii in honor of Dr. Traub. In unearthed words, today's words are all about a tree of July the linden tree. This first one's from the American poet and author William Cullen Bryant, and the poem is called Linden. The linden, in the fervors of July, hums with a louder concert. When the wind sweeps the broad forest in its summer prime, as when some master hand Exulting sweeps the keys of some great organ. Ye give forth the music of the woodland depths, a hymn of gladness and of thanks. And here's a poem called Linden Bloom by the American poet and author Amy Clampett. Before midsummer density, opaques with shade, the checkered tables underneath. In daylight, unleafing lindens burn green gold a day or two, no more, with intimations of an essence I saw once, in what had been the pleasure garden of the popes at Avignon, dishevel into half, or possibly three-quarters of a million hanging intricately tactile, blonde bell poles of bloom. The in midair resort of honeybees, her suit cotillion, teasing by the milligram out of those necklaced nectaries, aromas so intensely subtle. Strollers passing under looked up confused, as though they'd just heard voices or inhaled the ghost of derelict splendor and or of seraphs shaken into pollen dust. No transubstantiating pope or anti-pope could sift or quite precisely ponder. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book. Catherine at Home by Catherine M. Ireland. This book came out in 2016, and the subtitle is A Guide to Simple Entertaining. 
I ordered a copy of this book at the start of the pandemic, and what I thought would be a simple book of eye candy became an inspiration for using fresh ingredients from the kitchen garden, decorating my outdoor spaces for more comfort and beauty, and for coaxing me out of the house by heading outdoors for breakfasts, lunchtime picnics, teas, barbecues, and dinners by candlelight. Kathy Ireland is among House and Garden's 10 to watch architects and designers expected to influence 21st century style. For the last decade, House Beautiful has named her one of the top 100 designers in the United States. And she's also the author of Creating a Home and Classic Country. This book is 224 pages of gorgeous. It's truly a beautiful scrapbook of ideas and style. You can get a copy of Catherine at Home by Kathy Ireland and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $9. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. On this day in 1936, the Danish botanist Clarence Henry Dennison celebrated his 103rd birthday. Dennison was once an internationally recognized authority on botany, and he led a wonderful life. He served as a captain under Christian IX in Denmark's war with Germany. He was wounded in battle captured by the enemy, shipwrecked on the island of Crete, and sailed around Cape Hope. After the adventurous days of the soldier and sailor, he became a professor at the Copenhagen School of Botany. And among his pupils was a little princess who later became Queen Alexandria, mother of King George of England, and a little prince who later became King Constantine of Greece. Now, regarding Denison's 103rd birthday, the newspaper reported that the men's Bible class of St. John's Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, Florida, had planned a surprise birthday party, but the jolly old Dane winked as he hinted it's hard to surprise the man who's been around for 103 years. Dennison immigrated to America in 1881, and he lived to be 111 years old. Now that's an old botanist. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener, and remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram. And listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.